into Paul's ministry. Um, we didn't start with Paul for a reason. And the reason being is I wanted to lay out the understanding that from John the Baptist all the way to Peter, there was something that ran in common with John the Baptist, Christ, and the apostles, and that was they preached remission of sin. So I emphasize that uh, pretty significantly through the course and time uh, that we've covered this. Now, with that said, if you would, turn to Acts chapter 2. Like I said, we'll kind of, you know, go on, move forward, and things of that nature from here. This is the account of Peter preaching. We covered this before, but I want to go a little bit further than what we normally cover here. But in Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter preaching to these Jews and told them that they killed the Lord, they crucified him, and that I think the thing that got him is not just killing him, but the fact that Christ rose from the dead, and now you're going to have to face him. I mean, that, that's really what uh, convicted him seriously. So in verse 37, uh, when he had preached this uh, murder indictment, and the fact that Christ rose from the dead, uh, they, it says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Once again, there is your remission of sins, not forgiveness, remission. Uh, then let's look, continue on in verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, 3,000 in our case, based on our church size, is not really significant. However, uh, considering the fact that they were in a bad situation there, 3,000 was significant at that point in time, and I'm going to show you why in just a minute. Verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, when I talk about the 3,000 souls, you've got to consider the environment. Um, in this particular case, Peter's at Jerusalem preaching to these Jews there. And actually, that's the crew that basically put the Lord to death. I mean, he, these are what we characterize, characterize as bad guys. So there's a bunch of folks there, 3,000. Now, to show you why it was significant, in verse 40, look there. Oh, by the way, before we go there, I wanted to just comment on this. In verse 44 and 45, and all that believe were uh, together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. So the apostles' doctrine included that if you're going to be a part of this, you've got to sell all your goods and then give the money to the apostles and they would distribute it. Uh, there are those that claim to be Pentecostalists today. And I have found in my experience over the years that every Pentecostalist that I come across, not one of them will ever bring their belief down to verses 44 and 45. I mean, I've, I've talked with a lot of them, and they all seem to sh stop short of 44 and 45 because they get to church in their car, they leave church in their car, they go to their house. In other words, they're not adhering to the doctrine that they claim they're a part of. So just telling you that in case you have a friend or somebody you run across that's a Pentecostal, it gives you a little bit of understanding which you can tell them about that time and, you know, what they should be doing. So, but anyhow, talking about um, the environment that Peter was in, verse 40 again. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, 
Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Um, by the way, how many of you use, besides reading it in your Bible, untoward, and it appears one time in your Bible, we just read it, how many of you ever use the word untoward? We, you know. Huh? Yeah. It's kind of like con conjunction, junction, which your function never taught us untoward, did it? You know, I mean, it just wasn't ever there. You know, it was, it was a little bit more basic. Untoward uh, is used just this one time. And I'll read you the definition. This is just going into Strong's and pulling up the uh, definition there. Um, I did look it up in the Webster's and it held the same type meaning. But it means crooked, curved, perverse, or wicked. And I thought, curved? Curved? And then when I looked at the other definition words, crooked, perverse, or wicked, um, think about the saying. You know, we think that we have sayings that are very new and we, we started them. Well, you know, the Bible says nothing's new under the sun. Have you ever heard somebody make reference to another individual and said they're crooked as a snake? Yeah. You know, well, that comes from the idea of them being, you know, like a snake, curved, right? So that's what untoward is. It, it gives the impression of someone who is crooked, uh, perverse, or wicked. And so the generation that Peter was in at that time was an untoward generation. And so God's wrath is going to wind up being poured out upon this generation. Now, he didn't necessarily do it at this time. He did it in A.D. 70 when Titus came through with his Roman army and he burned the city down, Jerusalem. He leveled it and off the Jews were taken into slavery and captivity. So, uh, and that's not the only judgment they have. They have the judgment after their death also, by the way. So this is that untoward generation. Uh, the word generation is pretty common. We use it. It just has to do with a specific birth time of a group of people, and they go through their life till they die, and that's that generation. We've had several in this country. Y'all hear of uh, the millennials, millennial generation. How about Generation X? You ever hear of that? The baby boomers was a generation. So they go, what, you're a, well, not a baby anymore either. But you see how it goes through a generation? Well, they had a generation that was born and carried through, and it was there during John's time, it was there during Christ's time, and it was there during the apostles' ministry in that early Acts time. And there's something that is absolutely very, very important about this. In other words, we go to the board and do the time when Christ begins his ministry. Well, the X back here is John, and that's John the Baptist. Christ begins here. John is put to death. He's crucified, and we'll just come out here, and this is Peter. And so here we have a time frame, more or less, there. And in this time frame, ex it, in existence was this untoward generation. Now, I'm going to show you the importance of this untoward generation. And I almost was like, oh, God, I ought to do this on Sunday, but we'll just see where it goes. Anyhow, let me show you the importance here. Turn to Galatians and go to Galatians chapter 4. In Galatians chapter 4, read with me starting in verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, having read that, I'm going to tell you, I purposely misread it. I don't know if anybody caught it, but I misread it. 
I'm going to misread it again and see if you catch it. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoptions of sons. You caught it? Huh? Adoption of sons. D. Let's try it again and I'll read it correctly. Let's try it again. I'll read it correctly. I purposely left off a little bitty word. And remember, little words in your Bible, they don't make any, they're not important. Come on. That doesn't matter. Verse 4. But when the fullness of the time. I skipped the. Made the fullness of time. Yes. Said fullness of time. And it's easy for your eyes to gloss over the little words. The little words are big in your Bible. That's why they're there. But when the fullness of the time. You see, folks, time is just a general frame there. You know, beginning of time, end of time, middle of time. It, it can be just anywhere. When you say, but when the fullness of the time is come, was come, that is like putting a point on a time board. So, Jesus Christ begins his ministry at this point in time. Christ was sent into this world he was the Son of God. Christ, being opposed by the Pharisees, when they came up to him, he challenged them because they claimed to be Abraham's children. And he basically told them in John that ye are of your father, the devil. Here's the picture. God sent His Son at the perfect time. Why is it the perfect time? Think. Now we've got to go back and think a little bit. Go forward and think. The perfect time. God took His Son, put Him into a house, the world, where there are children living in this house. They are the children of the devil. God took his son and put him amongst them. Why would God do such a thing? Why would he stick him right there in the midst of the untoward generation? Look in Ephesians. Go to chapter 5. In Ephesians 5. Look in verse 25. Good reading for when I do weddings and things. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. No man taketh my life. He was sinning there because he loved the church. Well, you come out here, and guess what you have? The church. That's Paul declaring that, so we know the church he's referring to is the body of Christ. So, when Christ was in this world here, as the Son of God, He was in a time during an untoward generation. They were the children of the devil. So it was the fullness of the time. Not just time. He could have picked any time. But it was specifically put here. He was spe specifically put here for the sole purpose that he would be delivered up. And what delivered him up? Not the powers that be. 
They had no power over him. What delivered him up? Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He subjected himself. He was made a little lower than the angels. He humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. Nobody taketh my life. Hence, when he went to the cross, it was love that brought him to the cross. Who was the love for? According to Ephesians 5.25, the church. God, I mean, if you just think about it, God put Christ in at the time so that everything would work out with the powers that be where he would be rejected, be condemned, but it was up to him to allow them to drive the nails into his hands and feet. All of that was done by God as God, say before the time here, before time, could look down time and he looks in this time that we're living in today. And he sees mankind lost. He sees mankind no good. He sees mankind that has no help unless he comes to their aid. So then he maps out this plan, this great council of the Godhead that maps out a plan where God can see the generations of man and go, Whoa! We have an untoward generation. Perfect timing. And Christ, before the foundation of the world, agrees to go in at that accepted time, the time, so that he would fall into that untoward generation. Folks, you go back there in his preaching, and his preaching is full of woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Woe. Because not only in A.D. 70 did they really get it. From Titus, but those guys are dead. And there's a great white throne judgment that now they're going to wind up being brought out of hell and being brought before the Lord and have to face. Whoa! And I'll slow it down. Great white throne judgment. Whoa! Woe unto you. So you see the importance of the untoward generation and how it came into play at that particular time. So with that said, let's continue on with Peter and look back in Acts, turn back in Acts. In Acts chapter 6, sorry about that, kind of looking over some things here. In Acts 6, Verse 5, and kind of jumping right into this thing already gone. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and great company of priests were obedient to the faith. So where are they at? They're in Jerusalem, right? Okay, isn't that where Peter was? Yeah, the untoward generation. So this thing continues on. In other words, Stephen then rises up, and all of a sudden Stephen has a couple chapters dedicated to him. Not good ones, but uh, dedicated to him in Acts. Uh, And so if you come on down to chapter 7, 
And look in verse 54. We've read this before. Let's do it again. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly in the heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes, their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Now we're getting into the Saul part of this. Uh, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this into the charge. When he had said this, he fell asleep. So they stoned Stephen, they killed him. And in verse 1 of chapter 8, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. Now why do you think there was great persecution against the church at Jerusalem? untoward generation, okay? They were not very good folks. So they wound up killing Stephen. Jerusalem is the core of here, of this. Now, uh, let's move a little far, further down. Um, when we covered uh, last week, you go to Acts chapter 10. Peter now is sent to Cornelius, which is a Gentile. Make a couple comments here in Acts 10. This is the vision that Peter was given in verse 11. And he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet, knit at four corners and let down to the earth. Verse 12. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowl, fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common and unclean. And the voice spake again unto him the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. And a couple kind of more humorous things that ran across my mind was the fact that with what was going on in Jerusalem, here is Peter, he's over... He is over in Joppa, which is a city that is kind of southwest of Jerusalem, and it's on the Mediterranean coast. Very beautiful coastal city, just like today. Uh, and so he's over there living with another guy uh, named Simon. And uh, this thing, this vision that the Lord gave him was all about Peter going to these Gentiles. And I just thought on more of a humorous note, is that here was Peter in Jerusalem. <laughs> John had been killed. Uh, the Lord had been killed. It's an untoward generation. We read where he said that. There was great persecution, Acts 8, verse 1, on the brethren that were there uh, with the stoning of Stephen and things of that nature. And so the Lord's telling this guy, go to Cornelius, the Gentile. I'm just thinking that if I was Peter, after all I went through at Jerusalem, I'd kind of welcome a change of venue. You know what I mean? I'd be like, yeah, I'll go there. It can't be any worse than Jerusalem. I mean, that would be what's running through my mind. But Peter, obviously, from his Jewish background, had an issue with going to those Gentiles. And ultimately, he did. And so, consequently, you read in verse 34, the so-called light comes on to Peter. He says, then he opened his mouth when he's over there with these Gentiles. He said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So, you see, Peter ultimately had this understanding that he was to be there. And the key, key thing in what he told these Gentiles is found in verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive what? Remission of sins. Folks, that's very, very important. So they're following Peter after Peter's doctrine concerning remission of sins. So what we have now is a situation where Peter now is carrying that on. Now in the meantime, there's that guy Saul. You remember Saul in Acts chapter 7 and carried on into Acts 8? 
Well, he shows up in Acts chapter 9, and he's got a little issue that's come up with the Lord himself. He's on the road to Jerusalem in Acts 9. Look over in Acts 9, verse 1. Acts 9, verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto where? To that untoward generation is where he's going to bring them to. And wait till they get a hold of them, right? So he's bringing them back to Jerusalem. So in verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven. He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonishing, astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Pretty good question. Maybe we ought to I'll ask that question, right? Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And so consequently a man, down in verse 10, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, And to him saith the Lord in a vision, Ananias, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and Inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for he beholdeth, he prayeth. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on, on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at where? Jerusalem, right? The untoward generation there. So Ananias is hesitant in this thing. I mean, can you blame him? I mean, he understands what's gone on. He understands that those early church Christians were being persecuted. He understands that this man Saul was going out into strange cities outside of Jerusalem and rounding up Christians, bringing them back to Jerusalem. So you can kind of understand Ananias' hesitation about this, uh, which you can't blame him. I mean, come on, it's a hazardous deal here. And so in verse 14, And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said to him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias then understood from the Lord, didn't question him three times, by the way, he then understood from the Lord that he was to go and get uh, Saul, and Saul then is going to be this great preacher, which he became. His name was changed to Paul, who became the apostle of the Gentiles. And real quick, in that transition of Saul coming in and beginning his ministry, you know what Saul never did? He never questioned the Lord three times, being a Jew, by the way, about going to the Gentiles. Peter did. Saul never did. Kind of like the revelation that Saul got. Doggone it, he believed it. Peter was a little thick-headed on all this. You know, he had, he had principles he had to stand upon. Saul's so like, what will thou have me to do? And he went, right? So Saul then begins his ministry. And so that's kind of where we are going to, really be moving in the next weeks with Paul's ministry. So, with that having been said, turn to Romans chapter 1. Now, that was the start of the message. Now, we're going to go into study tonight. This begins it. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Chapter 1, verse we've read many, many times. Just give you some food for thought after we read this verse. Romans 1, verse 16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So we see Paul got the gospel of Christ, which is not the gospel that Peter preached. This is a different gospel in that 
Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised again, and by faith in Jesus Christ, all men that believe are then justified in that truth, that body of truth of the gospel that was given to Paul. And the reason why this would be so shocking to any of the apostles that was before him is because Paul was a blasphemer. So consequently, Paul could not have been saved under this ministry as he was out, basically taking out Christians at this time and having them uh, put to death and imprisoned. So he obviously had to have a gospel that was different from Peter and the rest of the apostles. He had to because he could not have been saved under this. So Paul then goes out and his command is to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. Now, here's a question, food for thought. Considering the fact, and I mean, folks, we don't even know, we don't really have to go back to the prophets, but I'll just mention this, the prophets. Who killed the prophets? Who was the one that killed the prophets? Say it. The Jews. And the reason why we know that, and maybe I didn't do you guys justice, is when we read about Stephen what brought on his stoning was previous verses. I apologize for that. Previous verses. He told them, which of the prophets have not your fathers killed? So that kind of got them stirred because they're all about their God, right? Well, they thought by putting them to death, they were doing God's service. That's what Christ said, by the way. So think about it. The Jews were the ones that put the prophets to death. John was ultimately killed as a rejection of the Jews. Christ was put to death by the rejection, by wicked hands and a determinate counsel. You're crucified and slain. But we do know this. It was his love that allowed him to go to that cross. Peter and them rise up in this early church is under great persecution by Saul, who was a Jew. And so consequently... Here Paul, who is a Jew, gets saved, and then God, it's like he starts the whole thing over to the Jew first. It's like, man, we're back at peg one. So the question is, why the Jew first? Why send this man back into, basically, the untoward generation, those Jews? worth asking right and when you think about all this I don't know I'm going to study and get the answer next week no I'm just kidding <laughs> all right look with me um, go to first kings I'm trying to figure out how much stuff I need to do here In 1 Kings, the lead prophet at that time is a man named Elijah. You want to read about a rough, tough guy. Elijah is your guy. Um, I always envisioned the guy, and John the Baptist, who was really like Elijah also, as being this Harley guy that's scruffed and, I mean, leather jacket and just I mean he's just a rough character he's the prophet not so pretty and elegant the king of the time was a Jew named Ahab and Ahab was married to a little lady named Jezebel something that was so significant that even Rod Stewart sang about her. So anyhow, if you don't know Rod Stewart's song, you don't have no clue as to what I was talking about. Uh, he just absolutely lost on that one. 
She was a real Jezebel, he said. And he probably wrote the song based on experience, too. Uh, but anyhow, you can get some of your best songs that way. So you have Ahab the king married to Jezebel, and Elijah is your, uh, is your prophet. What happened was Jezebel was involved in Baal worship. By the way, the name Jezebel means several different meanings. Baal, B-A-A-L. Baal exalts. Or Baal is husband to the woman. Or Jezebel means unchaste. She was a real Jezebel. So Ahab is married to this Jezebel woman. Jezebel was involved in Baal worship. Consequently, got the children of Israel involved in Baal worship. Elijah gets the blessed privilege, sarcasm, to go in here and do some ministering with Ahab and Jezebel. In 1 Kings chapter 18. It's a lot really to be read. And I'm kind of cutting out some of the stuff. And maybe next week, because we're running up on the end of the hour. Next week we'll kind of go back and touch on this. Look in verse, chapter 18 of 1 Kings, look in verse 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou in thy father's house. In that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. So Ahab has, and they led Israel into this. Now look what they have to help them along in the worship of Baal. Verse 19. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So they're all in cahoots with Jezebel. She is kind of like, the the centerpiece in the trouble here, and Ahab not stepping up to the plate here and loves what he's getting as benefits because apparently there was a lot of money at stake and what have you. He plays along. And so uh, verse 20, So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together in the Mount Carmel. See, all the children of Israel that were captive there are brought in and the prophets are brought in. So, uh, by the way, just so we don't have to add it up, it was 850 prophets, just to let you know. And so in verse 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. In other words, I don't want to commit. You know, I, I don't know about all that. Then Elijah said, uh, then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire, and put no fire under. And I'll dress the other bullock, lay it on wood, put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. They're fixing to have a show here, and we're going to have our gods compete and see who's the one that is left standing at the end of this fire display. So then in verse 25, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first. For you are many, 
and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullet which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Bel from morning even until noon, saying, O Bel, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he's a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is journeying, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. That had to be a scene, you reckon? 450 of these guys hollering and begging for their God to reply, and now they're starting to cut themselves in the blood. I mean, it's just going everywhere. Verse 29, And it came to pass when midday was past, so we're deep into the day now, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. So they really tore that place up. And Elijah took 12 stones. How many children of Israel were there? How many tribes? Hmm, interesting. According to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water, pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. They did it a third time. And the water ran about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. So it's getting a good dousing here. And you got to figure that those prophets and all like, hey, if it didn't work for us and we had no water, it ain't going to work for this bull and all this water. Fine, ain't gonna, no, it's not going to work. Verse 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God of, in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. So he was in perfect order by doing all these things at that word. Very important, folks. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is the, the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the book uh, Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said to Ahab, Get thee up, eat, drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So real quick, what you see there is that you had Israel, and they were captured here and involved in that bell worship. They were exposed to it, and it was headed up, of course, by Jezebel. Ahab was an accomplice, and then they had these uh, priests of Baal, or the prophets of Baal, whatever they're identified as. And so... They did that whole sacrifice thing. It didn't work for the bell worshipers. It did work for the Lord, uh, for Elijah. And so consequently the fire comes down. It consumes him. It persuades Israel that he is God. The Lord, he is God. By the way, Paul makes mention of this in this regard. The Jews seek after a sign, right? Here's your sign. Here's your sign. So... Elijah goes in there basically to get these children of Israel out. Uh, 
Look over in chapter 19. And he's on a hunt now, boy. And we're just going to jump down to the end of this. Uh, in chapter 19 of 1 Kings. And they're going, I mean, this is, they're on a tear here. And it shall come to pass, verse 17, 19, 17. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall uh, Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Not Elijah, Elisha, who was in the role of the prophet after Elijah uh, was taken out. Now watch verse 18, very important. Yet I have left, I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which have not kissed him. So, in this idol worshiping country, you had 7,000 that were there, there was children of Israel that refused to worship Baal. They haven't bowed the knee, and they haven't kissed his uh, image. So, Elijah is by the Lord sent in there to get the 7,000 Jews that have not bowed the knee nor kissed Baal to get them out of there. That was the purpose of Elijah going in there. And ultimately, it uh, provides for some very interesting story. You may want to, on your own time, go back and read about this. Uh, consequently, after he killed the prophet, Jezebel was upset. She was mad, and she sought after Elijah. She's going after Elijah. He said, what you did to my prophets, the same's going to happen to you. And consequently, she goes after Elijah, and Elijah now runs, and he's hiding under a juniper tree in the fetal position, crying, oh, God, kill me. You know, I don't want to live anymore and all that stuff, which you can kind of understand his predicament because now he's being hunted down. And I've always said that that prayer is a little null and void because if he really wanted to die, all he had to do was go visit Jezebel. She was accommodating. But nonetheless, that's just a poor pitiful me prayer, which we all have, poor pitiful me prayer. But the interesting thing is, is the Bible says that Jezebel will be scattered in the field. <laughs> so she's standing up in her little condo, and one of the servants shoves her out. And it says she splattered, and the chariots ran over her. The dogs ate her in the street and after they ate her they went in the field hence she would be scattered in the field so piece it together folks God got the laugh last laugh last laugh with this woman keep in mind for next week Jew first back with Elijah 7,000 back there that didn't bow the knee. So Elijah went in, had to endure some stuff, risk his life to get the 7,000. We're going to hold up here. And we're going to continue this next week. Keep that in mind. We'll review it, obviously, but um, we'll go forward from there. All right, thank you.